I'd like you to go with me to Acts chapter 17 again, please. Acts chapter 17. First of all, I want you to be aware of the audience. Paul is speaking to a whole lot of philosophers. People who like to sit down and debate and philosophize about life. And sometimes we even go to the extent of trying to philosophize about God. And today I've entitled my presentation, What Color is God? Now the reason why I'm doing this is last week I preached the same heading and uh, sadly it was not recorded. Um, somewhere along the line my cell went flat so I decided to do it again today but one thing I struggle with is to preach exactly the same sermon <laughs> but the thought will be the same. And the question is what color is God? Many years ago when I was still studying for the came up in our study was the different theologies or religions that have cropped up. And every religion attempts in some way to reveal the God that they have seen. And one of the subjects that came up which was quite disturbing to me at that particular time was a course or a presentation that was put forward about it was called black theology and the debate was all about what color God was and I never realized that that could be such a problem and that's what made me think about this subject. I remember as a student, I used to have long hair. You might not believe that because I've got little hair left now. But I used to have long hair. Groomed, but long. But I remember the rector of Haldeberg College. I don't know if any of you would have known him, Dr. Arthur Kutsia. He would come walking past me, and as he would come walking past, he would go like this with his fingers, you know. Which was <laughs> hinting to me that I needed to have a haircut. And then, of course, there would be those students who come from a very conservative background, and they would say to me, do you know that God's word says that a man should not have long hair? You understand? And so immediately there was this debate about hair. Long or short. And then they would take me to scripture where they would show me that it's not becoming for a man to have long hair. But in the same section I would find out that it's not becoming for a woman to wear pants. Isn't that true? And I would look at this and I would start figuring out, okay, what is right and what is wrong? Short hair or long hair? Woman wearing pants or no pants? What is it all about? And I found that what we didn't really get involved with the God of the things. So for example, I then decided that the, the, the lamb is the word of God. So I decided to go and find out. And to my surprise, I found that in the time of Christ, they did not wear pants. In actual fact, men wore robes. Now, I thought that that was women's clothing, but I find that in the time of Christ, it was a common fact for men to be wearing women's clothing. And then further to that, I found out that according to custom, Christ's hair was long. And according to custom, I found out that he had a beard that was actually split. He would part the beard at the bottom. Because he came from Nazareth. And in order to show that you come from Nazareth, you would split the beard. Even the thought that he had a beard. 
I mean, should a man be shaven or beard? And we start getting up with all of these things, and all of a sudden it made me wonder, okay, if I, if I got a closer look at Christ, what color would his eyes be? The Jewish culture, and it coming from the, the seed of um, David, from the house of Jesse, he would have character traits, well, not character traits, um, physical traits inherited by, by that family. That would come across as time goes on. And to my surprise, I found out that David was a rugged man. He wasn't very tall. He was actually short by stature compared to his brothers. There was nothing about David that would have attracted your attention to him. In actual fact, he was a bit smelly because he was always in the, the bush. I don't think he wore much deodorant. Do you understand what I'm trying to conclude? And as I started looking at that, I was starting to wonder if that is from whom Christ came, the descendants, because Mary, his mother, came from that background. So the probability from a gene point of view, it would be interesting to know what color eyes he would have had. Probably brown. But we're not sure. Color hair, without a doubt, would have been darkish color. Because if you look again at the custom of the Jew, that is the makeup. And yet I find in the book of Isaiah that we are counseled that Christ had nothing about him that drew our attention to him. He didn't stand head and shoulders like Saul above others. He wasn't necessarily eloquent of speech. He wasn't Mr. Hercules. There was nothing about him that would have attracted your attention to him. And yet somehow we get caught up with that. And we look at God, and no wonder God is presented as light. Nobody has seen God and lived. So we find very interesting that when you look at God, He is light. And how many of you have actually looked into light? Now I want to ask you, how long can you look into light without being blinded? And yet we are trying to look into light. The more you look into light, the more blinded you will become. But one thing you do know, God is light. Then the question comes, what color, if God is light, and I'm going to just use a little simple math here, God equal light. Are you with me? Then my next question is, what color is light? Now, when I look at this, that little pink flower up there will say, God is pink. But the leaf next to it will say, no, slightly off green. God is slightly off green. But then the other one will say, no, no, no. God is white. What color is God? According to the word, he's not a color. He is light. But we want to make it out about color. Then I think of the name Yahweh, which means I am. And it's almost like I am what? I am green, I'm in pink, I'm white, I'm black, I'm blue. That's interesting. What color do you want God to be? Because whatever you want him to be, he will be that. But that's not what consumes his mind. I remember, and I don't know how many of you had the experience of scuba diving. Now, at a certain depth, certain rays of the sun do not penetrate. And I found, to my surprise, at about 16 meters below water level, I felt a tremendous pain in my sinus area. And I couldn't understand what was going on. And I realized I hadn't equalized properly. Now, equalizing is where you get the air inside your head to be equivalent to the pressure outside. 
but I hadn't done it. And as a result, without knowing it, I had a nosebleed. Now, if I had to ask you right off the cuff here, what color is blood? You all tell me it's red. It's interesting, at about 16 meters below the water surface, blood is not red. It's actually green. And for a moment, I thought I was an alien. Because as I looked into my mask, I noticed this green stuff. But why could I not see red? Because the color could not go that deep. It could not be reflected. Now, just a matter of interest. When light shines on a particular color and it's reflected, say, like green, the reason why you see green is because it's the only color that was reflected. Everything else was absorbed. So if I look at pink, the only color that is reflected was pink, but all the colors are absorbed. So it's not about color. It's depending on what color you want to be. What do you want to reflect of light? But yet we caught up and we say, no, this is the right color. Or no, that is the right color. And in the end, we get into arguments about what color God is, where he's not a particular color. In actual fact, he is light. And why I chose this is because I find that even in our church, we are getting caught up with stuff that is really not important but we're making it a matter of eternal life or not. And you'll see, because I am going to answer what color God is. He has a beautiful color. But I'm going to reveal that to you just now. But I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 17, and I want you to look again at what Paul is addressing. And dear friends, this is the biggest problem we have to people who like to philosophize. And I want to tell you, you as a church love to philosophize. Why do I take this and why do I eat that? And we love to philosophize. Why did God say you can't eat pig? Oh, we philosophize. The reason why is because pigs are scavengers. Oh, no, the reason why is because pigs have measles. And we, got, we get into all of this kind of debate, trying to almost figure out why God said, you must not eat pig. Now, the interesting thing is, he did not say you cannot eat pig. Did you know that? He didn't say you can't eat pig. So how do you conclude that pig is unclean? He gave you the measuring tools. He said an animal that does not have a split hoof and does not chew the cud is what? So did God say pig is unclean? No, he didn't. But when you apply the rules, does a pig have a split hoof? Yes. Halfway there. But does it chew the cud? No. What is it now? It's unclean. You get a cow, has it got a split hoof? Yes. Does it chew the cud? Yes. Clean. You see, God didn't determine what was clean or unclean. He gave you the rules to figure out what was clean and unclean. And yet, the strange thing, they, we do need guidance. Because when it comes to birds, as to what is clean and unclean in birds, do you have a measuring tool? Birds who don't have feathers, they are unclean. Or birds who are scavengers, they are unclean. You see the interesting thing, all of a sudden you go and read there, God actually defines clearly what is unclean. He tells you, the owl is unclean. Why do we need direct information? Because there is no measuring tool to determine if it's right or wrong. 
Now, I want you to understand that sometimes we approach God as if we are approaching with a measuring tool to determine clean and unclean. Now, dear friends, sometimes you need to approach that as if you're looking at a bird. It's just because God said it's unclean that it's unclean. But when it comes to the pig, you can get into argument about that because you have got a measuring tool. Do you understand? But what do we do? We teach that pig is unclean. Later on, when your child is perhaps older and whatever, and they're going to a restaurant, do they have a problem with eating prawns? They take out the measuring tool, no split hoof, doesn't chew the cud. Can I eat it or not eat it? And we get caught up with this because we haven't got the measuring tool. And then to our surprise, we find out there is a measuring tool. There is fins and scales. Do you understand? Now, what does a frog have? It has fins. But does it have scales? Can you eat it or not eat it? Do you understand? You are given very clear guidelines. But we want to teach them sometimes. We just say you can't eat frogs. But you never teach why. The same, if I had to say to you, the first piece of Revelation chapter 13 is, and you have to be very careful there, when I say the first beast, which beast am I referring to? You know, the first beast mentioned in Revelation chapter 13 is the dragon. It's not the first beast that you thought. It's the dragon who stands on the shore looking out over the sea. And out of the sea comes the next beast. But it's a dragon who gives his authority to the beast. But I guess you were going to say to me that the first beast is Rome. But the first beast is the dragon, and the dragon is who? Now, very interestingly, can you measure who the dragon is? Is there a way in which you can identify who the dragon is? How do you know who's the dragon? Is there measuring? You know, is it, is it an angel that is dark? You know, he's omnis. Um, uh, um, omnis. You know, he's, he's covered. You can't see. What kind of angel approached Christ? Angel of light. So if you were, de de depending if it was a good angel or a bad angel, by if it was dark or light, you are in serious trouble. How do you know who the dragon is? You see, dear friends, we know who the dragon is is because the Word of God tells me who the dragon is. The Word of God says that the dragon is that old serpent, the devil, Satan. The Word had to tell me who the dragon is. God made it very clear. When he said, spoke to Adam and Eve, he said that there is a dragon, and this is who he is. But she least expected it to be a serpent, because somehow she had in her mind that it was this creature walking around with horns, with a fork in his hand, and he, he, he had a, a tail. That, where do we get this all from? So again, I ask you, what color is God? So when I start looking at all of this, I start realizing that even the way in which we approach the word, we tell people that is the Catholic Church. And I'm using now the second, bit, the second one. God didn't say, I don't read. Just keep your fingers in Re Acts chapter 17. And I want you to jump over to Revelation chapter 13. God does not say, I saw the Catholic Church coming up out of the sea. Does yours say that? I mean, how do, you, how do you know it's Catholic? And we all just say it's the Catholic Church. And because you identified to be the Catholic Church, you never see him in any other disguise except as a Catholic. And yet it says, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. 
Then I then sorry, the beast I saw resembled a leopard. That's amazing. All of a sudden it's taking you to a particular thing. Resembled a leopard. But it had the feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. All of a sudden, what animal am I talking about? Is it a bear? Is it a lion? Is it a, is it a, a leopard? All then all of a sudden, it's an undescribed beast. I can't put a figure on it. I can't explain it to you what it is. You know, dear friends, what do we do? We go and we start looking at measuring tools. How long did this beast rule for? 1,260 years. We start looking for all kingdoms that ruled for 1,260 years. Do you understand? It oppressed the saints of God. We go and look for who oppressed the saints of God. Do you know that the Spanish Inquisition was about oppression also? Was it the Catholic Church? Or was it a particular organization, a particular nation that persecuted people? You see, when we start applying rules, you can figure out what's going on. And dear friends, sometimes when I look at some of the measuring tools and I look at us and our behavior, we could be Catholic. You know how many people have said to me, the church said, this is it. Really, does the church tell you to do that? You see, if the church tells you to do that, that's the foundation for Catholicism. Catholicism says the church tells you. Protestantism says no ways. The church doesn't tell me, but who tells me? The word. Do you understand? If you're going around telling people that my, my pastor said it, and therefore that's right, man, I tell you, what color is God going? What color am I going to make him out to be? I will be biased. But the word is the truth. So again, I'm asking you, why are we getting caught up with things that really are irrelevant? Are there going to be marriages in heaven or not? Some say. Some say. I want to ask you, is that really relevant? Do you know that in heaven you're going to float in the cloud and play a harp? Or in heaven you're going to have your own vineyard? I want to tell you this. I'm not into vineyards. I really don't want a vineyard. Do you understand? What is heaven? I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor come into the mind of man what God has planned for you. But we all conjure these different kinds of things. You see, we philosophize. Go back again to Acts chapter 17. Paul approaches the people and he stands on the place called Areopagus. Now, Areopagus was just a place where people got together to listen to a speaker. And dear friends, I'm going to say to you, in some sense, this is Areopagus. You see, I've got the platform. You are the philosophers. You are determining if you agree with me or not. But I've been given the floor. And somehow we believe that when a person stands behind here, that only truth comes from here. How incorrect. How incorrect. And yet we look at ministers, and when a minister says something, we say, Amen. Really? The word teaches me you only say Amen to God. He is the Amen. And yet we make people Amen. We listen to certain preachers. They say what we want to hear, and we say, Amen. And we promote that preacher, because he's popular with us. But he might be entirely against the word. And we get caught up. We love what they talk about. Oh, I can't wait to go to his presentations. Is he teaching you the word? Or is it a great way of philosophizing? You know, birds of a feather flock together. 
Areopagus. I want you to understand this is Areopagus. Really, this is Areopagus. And you have heard something that I've been saying that's caught your attention, and you've allowed me to stand up and speak to you. That's exactly what they did with Paul. They actually said to him, you have something interesting to say. You were speaking about it in the market, but we'd like you to come and speak with us. And all the people sitting down are going to determine if he is right or if he's wrong. Now, listen to the way he starts off. People of Athens. Now, I love, that's verse 22. I love the way that he draws your attention to Athens. Can any of you tell me a little bit about Athens? What is Athens? Athens. If I say Cape Town, what is Cape Town? Dear friends, do any of you know Cape Town? Can you tell me about any feature in Cape Town that gets your attention? Table Mountain. Thank you. Finally, some of you people realize that Cape Town it just happens to be over the hill. Did you know that? That's Cape Town. When I say Athens, where have I just placed you? You've placed me in Greece. I've placed you in Greece. He isn't in Rome. He isn't in Cape Town. He says, People of Athens, a certain kind of cultural thinking. You know that you get the myths coming from the Greek mythology. You get Zeus and you get Hercules and you get all of these things coming out of Greek thinking. You see, they tried to philosophize what God was all about. And because they were so uncertain about what God was all about, like he says, I walked around and saw that Greek people are very religious. Objects of worship, I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. Now, that is just so amazing to me, that sometimes if you're not sure about something, you will worship it anyway, just in case you missed out. <laughs> so I come along and I tell you something, you think, mm, yes, okay, we're going to do that from now on. How do you know if it's right or wrong? Just because I stand here and I've got the floor? No, oh, dear friends. You see, he says, you worship God ignorantly. Dear friends, how many of you are sitting here today worshiping God ignorantly? And yet you will claim that you are looking at him with intelligence. Because you see, that's what Greek philosophers are all about. We're using our intelligence to determine something. And yet I tell you that a lot of what we are doing in the church is out of pure ignorance. But I praise God for that because God winks at ignorance. But when you know the truth, no longer can you be winked at. So do you want me to carry on or do we just leave you in ignorance? Do you really want to know what color God is? Then Paul says, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. <laughs> that blows my mind. Here you are worshipping God, but you are ignorant regarding the very thing you're worshipping. You are ignorant regarding what he's requiring of you. You're ignorant, you, we speculate, we think this is what God wants, but you are really ignorant about what he wants. You know, if he wanted you to be a commandment keeper, then why did he send Jesus? Because he knew that you couldn't be commandment keepers. So you had to send Jesus. To be a man and to be a commandment keeper for you. I'm going to show you something. You'll see why I'm bringing this all out. It doesn't mean that you mustn't be a commandment keeper. Because I just found out in the lesson study that if I keep the commandments of our Father in heaven, I become family of Christ. But I want you to understand something. It didn't make me a savior. It didn't make me the savior of the world. I just became like Christ in keeping the commandments. But I can never be the savior. You can keep the commandments, but it doesn't make you the savior of mankind.
By calling people to keep the commandments, you are making them family of God, but you're not saving them with that. I want you to see, because Paul says, and he says, this very thing that you worship, you worship ignorantly, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. So what is he going to do? He's going to tell you the truth. He's going to really tell you what God is all about. What is God really all about? You know, dear friends, so many times, what is it that God really wants for you? Where does God stand out above all the other gods of the, of the earth? How do you know what color God is? Will you please go with me to the book of Galatians, and I'd like to show you what the color of God is today. When I look at God, this is the color I see. Galatians chapter 1. And I'm going to start reading from verse 1, and I'm only going to break it open as we go on. Galatians chapter 1 says, verse 1, Paul an apostle, sent not from men that nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with him. Okay, so I want you to understand something. Who sent Paul to the people in Galatians? Did the Seventh-day Adventist church send them there? Did the Seventh-day Adventist church send them to go and proselyte those people? You see, because that's what we do. We go to others and we proselyte them to become part of us. No, dear friends, we are not going out to make Seventh-day Adventists. We are going out sent by God. It says it, not by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. So if I have any role to be able to speak to you, I better speak to you from that point. If I speak to you because somebody sent me, I'm a disciple of some person on planet Earth, then I'm going to disciple you to become that person's follower. Whereas I'm calling you to be a follower of the person I follow. And that should be Jesus Christ. Not man. I want you to go further. It says there, and sorry, to the churches in Galatia. Now, it's not just one church, churches. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, listen to what he's doing. Grace and peace. I mean, I look at that and I think to myself, peace. How does, we have two key words there. Grace, which when you think about it, is unmerited favor. So unmerited favor is given to you. And peace. What is peace? The angels sang, peace on earth to all men, because you are highly favored by God. <laughs> all of a sudden, peace is all about good news. What is the good news? That you have found favor with God. That you can stand in his presence and not be fearful of death. I'm preparing a presentation on what are you waiting for? Judgment? Or wedding feast. Which one are you waiting for? You know, it's interesting. When I look at all of this, grace and peace from our Lord, Jesus Christ, from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus come to offer you? Grace and peace. Peace with God. Peace to be able to walk into his presence and say, Abba, Father. who gave himself for our sins to, to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Now, dear friends, now you can say, Amen. Now, the most amazing thing, just after that amen, it means truly what you've just said must be. What must be? Grace and peace. 
must be peace and goodwill to all mankind for unto you a savior is born now listen to this how did we find favor and peace with god how did we find that listen to the next words because this is the color of god i am astonished that you are this is verse six that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of christ and are returning to a different gospel now the word gospel actually means good news is this gospel still the good news to you or have you turned to another gospel that has become the good news to you have you been moved away from the gospel of christ to follow another gospel because listen to what he says which is really not a god sorry which is really no gospel at all when i'm asking you to do something that is not what jesus christ brought i'm asking you to do something that's not good news did you hear me which is really no gospel at all evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of christ but even if we or an angel which means the devil himself from heaven should preach a gospel to you other than the one preached to you let them be under god's curse as we have already said and so now i say again if anybody is preaching to you a a gospel other than the one you accepted the other one than the one who saved you let him be under god's curse so i'm going to ask you this question now what color is god you know one of the most amazing answers to me is what that one that paul gave it, paul said to the jew i become a jew in order to save the jew in order to be to save the gentile i become a gentile in order to save the gentile but in the end he concludes that i belong to god and so what i'm trying to say to you dear friends if anything that is preached to you from this pulpit does not enhance the gospel message that you already received then you should not accept this message did you hear me the purpose of here is to edify you and to establish you in your faith. Not to give you a different faith. Not to give you a different gospel. So what is God's color then? God's color is that his desire is that none should perish. But that every single person, regardless of creed or color, that every single person will receive life. And that life is in none other than his gift, which is Jesus Christ. The church is not your gift. You do not give the Seventh-day Adventist church to people. We go out and we make Seventh-day Adventists as if we are that gift that they have to have. No, dear friends, the gift you must give them is the gift that God gave us, which was Jesus Christ. Now, embodied in Jesus Christ is all the truth. So if you are presenting any truth, let it be embodied in Christ. I'm astonished that we as a church that claims to have the three angel message which is the eternal gospel is preaching another gospel it's soon to be Christmas not really in the literal sense of the exact day and all that but the concept of celebration 
I ask you this question, what is it all about? That's what people make it out to be, but it's not. It's celebrating something that God did for you in order to save you. And that's the good news.